We're now about to fall down the rabbit hole. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is a literary fantasy, or more specifically, a literary nonsense novel published in 1865 by Lewis Carroll. It has never been out of print since it was published. Oscar Wilde, Queen Victoria, and Eleanor Roosevelt have been just a few of its esteemed admirers. Yet, pretty much since its initial publication, Alice in Wonderland, as it's popularly known, has made many other adults uncomfortable, perhaps with good reason. Alice in Wonderland was written explicitly for one young girl, Alice Little, and her two sisters. Lewis Carroll, the pen name for Charles Lutwidge Dodgson, was an Oxford mathematician, an early photographer, and a puzzle maker who befriended the three daughters of Henry Little, the dean of Christ Church College, Oxford. On July 4th, 1862, a day immortalized by Alice in Wonderland as the Golden Afternoon, Carol and the Reverend Robinson Duckworth rode up the Isis River in Oxford with those three young girls, Lorina Little, age 13, Alice Little, age 10, and Edith Little, aged eight. Along the way, Lewis Carroll entertained the sisters with one of the many stories he was wont to make up. He called this one Alice's Adventures Underground. The tale so delighted the little sisters that Alice asked Lewis Carroll to write it down. Two years later, he presented her with the manuscript. When it was published, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was an immediate sensation. In the years since, it's been made into countless films and TV shows, including an episode of Star Trek. It's also inspired novelists like Vladimir Nabokov and James Joyce, and has even been credited as one of the origins of surrealism as an artistic movement. In fact, Salvador Dali did over 10 paintings of Alice in Wonderland. Then there's the neurological complaint dubbed Alice in Wonderland syndrome. It entails the misperception of objects as larger or smaller than they are. Those are just some of the far-flung influences of Alice in Wonderland. But as the 20th century got underway, and as Freudian theories gave people a different understanding of children's sexuality, more and more adult readers expressed concerns over Alice's adventures. In the early 1900s, the state of New Hampshire banned the book from all public schools because the novel was accused of promoting sexual fantasies and masturbation, as well as derogatory characterizations of teachers and of religious ceremonies. The discomforting sexual associations with Alice in Wonderland derive not only from the text itself, but from the possible erotic attachments of the book's author, Charles Dodgson. An avid photographer, Dodgson liked to take pictures of young girls, the daughters of his friends and acquaintances. Oftentimes, he photographed those girls naked. In Victorian times, this hobby was not cause for suspicion. As one Alice in Wonderland scholar has pointed out, great painters like Titian and Botticelli painted nude children, and early photographers took their examples from art. However, it is interesting that for a time, Dodgson was banished from the company of Alice and her sisters. It's been suggested that he may have proposed marriage to Alice. He would have been 31 at the time, whereas Alice would have been 11. Dodgson's life and his questionable activities are one thing, but there's plenty of material within the text of Alice in Wonderland itself to give library and school boards pause. The most controversial and off-targeted scene takes place in chapter five, 
after Alice enters Wonderland and meets the blue, and according to many censors, suggestively phallic caterpillar. The caterpillar sits atop a mushroom, smoking a hookah, and offers Alice advice on how to find the white rabbit. He also provides Alice with a piece of the mushroom that will alter her size to help her on her journey. The presence of the hookah and of the body and allegedly mind-altering mushroom was an outrage to many schools, parents, and religious groups, especially as the psychedelic 60s got underway and the implications of such a trip became clearer. If you are of a certain age, you will remember Grace Slick of Jefferson Airplane singing the lyrics to White Rabbit about the mind-altering pill that makes you tall or small. By the way, scholars speculate that Dodgson might have been drawing on experiences with opium or laudanum, which were readily available in Victorian times. The fact that Alice herself grows taller and smaller in this chapter has also been read by scrupulous school boards as, how can I put this delicately, a depiction of male arousal. In any case, Alice in Wonderland began to be frequently banned all over the United States during the 1960s and into the 1970s, and scattered bannings continue to this day. In light of these anxieties about encoded messages about pedophilia, masturbation, and drug use, perhaps the strangest objections to Alice in Wonderland arise from what seems to be a benign presence in the book, the animal characters. In 1931, the governor of the Hunan province in China banned the book because of the talking animals, which he deemed an insult to the human race. Animals should not use human language, the governor insisted, adding that it is disastrous to put animals and human beings on the same level. As preposterous as this accusation may sound, the objection to humanizing animals is not an uncommon reason for censoring books. Winnie the Pooh, in fact, has attracted a lot of the same pushback. The first collection of stories by A. A. Milne featuring the honey-obsessed bear, called simply Winnie the Pooh, was published in 1926, with the house at Pooh Corner following in 1928. In the years since, and especially since the release of the 1966 Disney movie, Pooh has conquered the world. Streets in Hungary and Poland have been named after Winnie. However, that fame has also been accompanied by some familiar denunciations. Milne's books sit at number 22 on the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom's Top 100 Banned and Challenged Books of the 20th Century. As with Alice in Wonderland, Winnie the Pooh has sometimes been challenged because the idea of animals talking at the same level as their human counterpart, Christopher Robin, is considered an abomination by some religious groups. The presence of Piglet, Winnie's sweet, nervous, and timid little friend, has also raised the same concerns that we discussed in the previous lecture, namely, that the character of a talking pig might offend Muslim and Jewish students who abstain from eating pork for religious reasons. And then there are a few out-of-left-field objections to the tales of Winnie and his friends, one of which occurred in Russia in 2009. In that year, the Wall Street Journal reported that Russia's Justice Ministry placed the book on a list of banned material and labeled it pro-Nazi because a depiction of Pooh Bear wearing a swastika was discovered among the personal possessions of a known political extremist. If one extremist was in possession of a Nazi Pooh, the local courts concluded that it stood to reason that others may follow suit. 
In 2014, another bizarre banning of poo caught the Internet's fleeting attention. The issue here was less the conversational abilities of the denizens of the Hundred Acre Wood than the way Pooh himself was depicted in the famous illustrations by Ernest Shepard. A small town in central Poland blocked Winnie the Pooh from being installed as a local playground mascot because of the bear's so-called improper attire and dubious sexuality. A town official reportedly complained at a council meeting that Pooh doesn't wear underpants because it doesn't have a sex. It's a hermaphrodite. Conservative members of the council agreed with another member declaring that Pooh is half naked, which is wholly inappropriate for children. One shudders to think what any of these groups would have said about that classic 1960s sitcom about a talking horse named Mr. Ed. Let's turn from talking animals in classic children's literature to animals who raise the ire of adults because of other things, like, say, their alleged political views. Our family dog is a medium-sized but muscular black and white pit bull mix named Nellie, in honor of Nellie Bly, the pioneering female journalist who raced around the world in 72 days. Our Nellie might well race that fast if she were chasing a squirrel or a rabbit, but otherwise, as she ambles along the streets of our neighborhood, she greets her dog friends and sniffs the grass and flowers in springtime. If she were a boy, we might have changed her name to Ferdinand, the fierce-looking but peaceable flower-loving bull. The story of Ferdinand is a children's story written by the American author Monroe Leaf. It was published in 1936 and sold some 14,000 copies. By 1938, it was the number one best-selling book in America, outselling Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind. The story took shape in 1935, when Monroe Leaf, who'd already written two children's books, was 29. A friend of his, an illustrator named Robert Lawson, needed work during the Great Depression. And so one rainy afternoon in October of that year, Leaf started scribbling a draft of a children's story that Lawson, who was gifted at drawing animals, might illustrate. Cats, dogs, and horses run rampant in children's books. So Leaf decided to write about an animal that hadn't yet found a home in the genre, a bull. In less than an hour, Leaf had written the story of a giant bull named Ferdinand, who prefers to sit under a cork tree and sniff flowers, rather than lock horns with his fellow bulls or take on a bullfighter in the ring. Leaf had never seen a bullfight or been to Spain. He called his bull Ferdinand because Ferdinand and Isabella were the only two Spanish names he knew. When the book was published in the fall of 1936, like most books, it seemed destined to slip into obscurity. But then something odd happened. After Christmas and into the early months of 1937, sales of the story of Ferdinand kept climbing. Think about those dates, 1936, 1937. Ferdinand had entered the world months after the beginning of the Spanish Civil War and a few years before the start of World War II in Europe. For generations, readers have understood Ferdinand the Bull as a pacifist tale, and Gandhi, as well as Eleanor Roosevelt, reportedly loved the story. Indeed, there were several international calls to award the Nobel Peace Prize to Monroe Leaf and Robert Lawson. But the message of Ferdinand the Bull, if indeed Leaf intended one, wasn't interpreted so simply. Cultural critics debated the question of whether the book was just a children's tale 
or a stealthy political tract. Newspapers of the era caricatured everyone from Franklin Roosevelt to Joseph Stalin as the passive bull. Adolf Hitler banned it in Nazi Germany, labeling it degenerate democratic propaganda. Ferdinand's politics were read as pro-Franco. They were also read as anti-Franco. In any case, the book was banned in Spain until Franco's death in 1975. Poor Ferdinand has also been diagnosed as manic depressive and schizophrenic. Some folks even found Ferdinand's supposed sexual identity something to worry about. Soon after the book came out, one columnist in the Cleveland Plain Dealer accused Ferdinand the Bull of softening up the youth of America. Certain irate fathers assert that the book is a deliberate attempt to make mollycoddles out of little boys. Mollycoddles, of course, was code for homosexual. To some adults of the early to mid 20th century and perhaps beyond, Ferdinand's passivity signified suspect masculinity. Among those who got worked up about Ferdinand's refusal to adhere to conventional masculine codes was the alpha male and bullfight enthusiast, Ernest Hemingway. In 1951, Hemingway published a short, fable-like story in the travel magazine Holiday entitled The Faithful Bull. Hemingway's target is clear. One time there was a bull whose name was not Ferdinand and he cared nothing for flowers. He loved to fight and he fought with all the other bulls and he was a champion. Everyone admired him and the man who killed him admired him the most. Ferdinand and his gentle but unwavering inclination to peaceful coexistence over violence and flowers over ferocity has triumphed over the Hemingways of the world and their exaltation of machismo. These days, as one critic has noted, Ferdinand is hailed as an icon of gender nonconformity, his tale a celebration of difference, a shift that serves as not a bad yardstick for how much the culture has evolved. I want to conclude this talk on classic children's literature and its discontents by turning to the illustrated books of Dr. Seuss, the pen name for Theodore Seuss Geisel. Of all the books I've talked about in this lecture, the ones written by Dr. Seuss and Monroe Leaf's The Story of Ferdinand are the ones I fondly remember reading or having read to me as a child. It's possible I encountered Goodnight Moon and Charlotte's Web in kindergarten or grade school, but I don't remember really reading them until much later. Alice in Wonderland for me was a grad school reading assignment, and the others were books I discovered when my own daughter was little. But I had a cherished childhood collection of Horton Hears a Who and Green Eggs and Ham and the Cat in the Hat books, along with a Cat in the Hat statue made from a do-it-yourself kit. I love Dr. Seuss and still do, although, as we'll see, in recent years, the works of Dr. Seuss have been subjected to some pruning, canceling, and downright banning. Dr. Seuss, as I'll call him, was born in 1904 and adopted his pen name as an undergraduate at Dartmouth. He studied for a PhD at Oxford, but at the urging of his first wife, began to take his inspired illustrations more seriously, soon making a lucrative career as a cartoonist and illustrator. His first children's book was published in 1937. And to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street derived its title from a street in his hometown of Springfield, Massachusetts. One of his most famous books, The Cat in the Hat, had its origins in a dare. In 1954, Life magazine published a report on childhood illiteracy, 
that suggested that children weren't learning to read because too many books for very early readers were dull. The director of education at the publishing house Houghton Mifflin compiled a list of some 348 words that he felt first graders should recognize. He then challenged Dr. Seuss to write a book incorporating 236 of those words in, quote, a book children can't but town. It took Dr. Seuss nine months, but the result was the cat in the hat. To this day, what became known as Dr. Seuss's beginner books, like The Cat in the Hat and Green Eggs and Ham, still outsell most newly published books for young children. The messages and images contained in those books, however, have become more contested in recent decades. Let's start with an outlier in the Seuss canon, The Lorax, published in 1971. It's a relatively grim book, informed by environmentalist concerns over deforestation in the Pacific Northwest and the recklessness of logging companies. In The Lorax, the fuzzy, mole-like title character battles an axe-wielding family called the Onceslers, who greedily harvest all of its colorful and completely imaginary truffula trees to manufacture thenides, a multi-purpose stocking. At the end of the book, the Lorax disappears, a victim, we suppose, of foul play, and the evil Onceslers cut down the last truffula tree. The only ray of hope is that one of the Onceslers requests that a seed from the last tree be planted and cared for. This is not exactly the lighthearted stuff of nonsense rhymes that we characteristically find in Dr. Seuss's work. Perhaps not surprisingly, the book's publication caused an uproar in thriving timber communities in the Pacific Northwest. Indeed, controversy over the Lorax has had a long afterlife, sporadically enraging the timber industry. One such controversy occurred in 1989 in the small town of Laytonville, California, a three-hour drive north of San Francisco. Two prominent logging families claimed that the book which was required reading for second graders in Laytonville was a thinly veiled attack on the lumber industry, which for decades had been the region's lifeblood. Indeed, two anti-Lorax logging industry members got themselves elected to the local school board in order to push for having the book removed from the required reading list. The Lorax, it's probably safe to say, angered folks whose politics skew pro-business and politically conservative. But more recent attacks on Dr. Seuss's work have come from critics on the left. Read Across America, a national literacy program celebrated annually on or near the birthday of Dr. Seuss, used to be dominated by teachers and students dressed in the iconic red and white striped hat worn by the cat in the hat, and by posters of Seuss classics like Green Eggs and Ham. Not so much anymore. The story of how attitudes toward Dr. Seuss's work have changed is intriguing, but our time is short. So to do justice to that story, I'm going to continue the Seussical scrutiny in my next talk. Oh, the places you'll go, exclaimed Dr. Seuss in the title of one of his beloved books, often given to students as graduation presents. But Dr. Seuss himself could never have imagined the places his own books would go, or more to our point, where they'd be prohibited from going. <laughs>